So today we're continuing on in a series called Luke, Settled Truth for Unsettled Times. And today we'll be looking at the Holy Spirit. We're going to be looking at the teaching specifically related to the Gospel of Luke. And uh, so we're going to read a few scriptures to set this up. So would everybody stand for the reading of the word today? And Luke chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, we'll read a couple others just so that you can get the feel of where the message will be drawn from. But let's begin in Luke 3, verses 21, 22. Let's read. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Now Luke chapter 4 verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And then Luke 4 verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit, and the news about him spread through the whole countryside. Now, Jesus, I pray that as the word is taught today, that you, Holy Spirit, who have been sent to continue the work of Jesus among us, would you help us to more readily and clearly understand your purpose, function in and through our lives we pray these things in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. 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 The Lord bless you. You can be seated today. Now, I shared this last week that I would be sharing on the Holy Spirit. We've been looking at a variety of themes inside the uh, book of Luke, and today is the Holy Spirit. And all I'm going to ask you is this. I, I, I know that there's a whole bunch of things that could be said, but I'm going to keep my remarks confined to the book of Luke. It's a challenge for a pastor like myself speaking on this because sometimes people's theology seems to uh, trend more towards what the tele-evangelist tells them <laughs> than what the Bible tells them. And so I'm just going to say, I'm, quoting, I'm not going to quote anything other than the scripture because I think the Bible has a pretty clear picture if we just know how to see it and if we're open and going to understand it. So... In his gospel, the reason I'm talking on the Holy Spirit, Luke mentions the Holy Spirit 17 times. So I think you could say, obviously, this is a significant theme to him, and he's trying to paint a picture because he's writing to uh, Gentiles, who many of them have no heritage whatsoever in the faith. So how do you explain the Holy Spirit to people who have no understanding of the Holy Spirit? So it's actually a great place to start for anybody so they have a better understanding and by the way he, he then after the gospel of Luke he wrote the book of Acts he uh, in, in the book of Acts he mentions the Holy Spirit 57 times how many can see he's trying to make a point and then by the time you get to the uh, books that the Apostle Paul wrote 13 of them he mentions the Holy Spirit 125 times now the reason I bring all this up is this Given the frequent references to the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, it's apparent that it had a vital role and expression in the church with all those references. So the other part of this is this. If a pastor was to avoid the topic of the Holy Spirit, you're leaving a lot of scripture sitting on the shelf. And it's not going to take people too long to go, seems to be steering clear of a very sensitive subject right now. Wonder what that's about because it's all over the Bible. It was a main, it was a main uh, 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 principle inside the New Testament church, the, the activity of the Holy Spirit. So, I, so what I'm doing is this. If it's a major theme in the Bible, then we're going to talk about it. Amen? So one of the challenges we ha that I have as a pastor, I will say this. How can the Bible have so much to say about the Holy Spirit, and yet there's all this tension and at times unbelief about the Holy Spirit? I don't think I'm saying anything here that many of you don't know. I've been in pastor's uh, forums uh, some, uh, of diverse denominations, and I am not going to be saying anything that says, hey, I'm more informed than they are, or I'm better, or more spiritual than they are. I respect their beliefs. But what I've noticed is this. We can get into those gatherings, and man, we're all about the Father. We agree on the Father. We're good with God the Father. And oh, man, we're good on Jesus, and we're just hallelujah, Jesus. And then you mention the Holy Spirit, and it's crickets. Because everybody knows that there's a diversity of view in the room, and nobody wants to be the first guy or woman to put their view on the table because they know there's going to be people who don't. What is it? 
that for some reason, that's the part of the Trinity we can't get on the same page with. Part of it is this. Could it be that's the reason the church is not advancing in America? The Holy Spirit was sent to advance the church, right? And then we can't agree on what God sent to advance the church. Maybe that's the reason a lot of places are stalling out is because until you settle and begin to understand where this Holy Spirit thing is and what it's for, there's gonna, it's gonna, it, you're missing a great tool that God has sent to us. So I'm going to be respectful of the fact that I'm just under the assumption there's people in the room going, I don't know about all this. So let me just, let me, can, I put you, can I put you at ease? You ready for this? Big statement I always like to make. Pastor Greg doesn't do weird. <laughs> How many went, hallelujah? So you don't have to worry about any trick, anything going to happen, or I'm going to stretch you outside your box, I'm going to do, no, 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 no. Just listen. And like I said, I'm sticking with the gospel of Luke and what it shows us about the Holy Spirit. If he's mentioning it 17 times, he's making a point. Now, here's the other part of this. One element key to understanding the New Testament as a whole is to know that it was written in the Eastern mindset, not the Western mindset. If you don't understand what I just said, let me just say, you're in the Western mindset today. <laughs> okay? And there's another, there, if you haven't discovered by now, there are other people who see the world differently than you do. And they write about it from a different viewpoint. Eastern mindset, Western mindset. And what's the difference? The, Eastern, the Western mindset primarily utilizes the chronological perspective. In other words, we want stories to be told in chronological order. What is wrong with people who can't do that, we think, as Americans? Okay? And so we like it that way. So let me, let me show you a, a way. Uh, well, before I share that, I'll give you two examples here on this next point. The Eastern mindset primarily utilizes the painting of a picture perspective. So I can give you two examples. So here's an example. Did you know that Paul wrote his books of the Bible, almost most, most of them, not all of them, but most of them, and particularly the books of the Bible that he wrote that reference a lot of the Holy Spirit? Did you know that he wrote his books first and then Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and Acts? We sometimes think that Luke wrote his books and then Paul wrote his stuff. And we do, you know why we assume that? Because that's how it's, that's the order of the Bible. Can I, I hate to break it to you, did you know the Bible's not in chronological order? <laughs> yeah, Paul wrote his stuff, and then Luke wrote Luke and Acts. So I know some people who use that layout that, well, Luke wrote this, and he wrote this in Acts, and then Paul kind of cleaned it up, and Paul kind of brought some closure to some of the things. I, you, you do know that Luke wrote his stuff after Paul wrote his stuff. So Paul wasn't cleaning up anything of Luke's. So what, why is that? Well, Paul wrote, if you notice, Paul has very few stories. He's mostly writing theology. And it appears that Luke thought people needed to know the story that produced the theology. So he writes the stories. So we go, oh, so in fact, he even writes about Paul getting saved. Okay, he wanted people to know the storyline. So that came, that came after Paul wrote his stuff. The other part I can show you, the mindset of a picture, is this. The book of Revelation. How many of you have ever said, I'm going to read the book of Revelation verse by verse, and I'm going to figure this out, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure out the end times. And then halfway through, you went, I have no idea what's going on here. Let me tell you why, because... The book of Revelation was not written in chronological order. Now, it has some chronological order elements, enough to make us think we can all figure it out. But he's talking about heaven, and then he backs it up and says, oh, by the way, back there on earth. He even talks about what's going on in hell, and he's just bouncing around. And the, the thing is, by the time he gets to the end, he has rejoined the chronological timeline that we Westerners like. And he summarizes what the, what the end's going to look like. But we have to understand, he's painting a picture. So if you've seen an artist, they sometimes paint over here, paint here, paint there, paint there. And I need it to get done about 75% before I figure out what they're doing. Because I'm the roller guy. You just, <laughs> you just start on the left, and you roll to the right, and things just emerge, you know? That's not how artists do it. They, they paint a portrait. They're all over the place. 
And you know, like for me, I need 75% done before I know, oh, this is what you're doing. This is what you're trying to draw. And you gotta know that's how they like to tell their stories. So as we go to the Gospel of Luke, you need to be aware of that. It's very tough for us to come with our chronological mindset and just go, why couldn't they just put everything on the Holy Spirit in one chapter? <laughs> and put it in chronological order, too, so that we get it. Well, so I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm somewhat taking Luke's teaching and trying to do that so that we have a better understanding. So here's a couple things that I want you to know about the Gospel of Luke. He actually has what I call a, a mini spirit seminar inside of his book because he's writing to people who have no orientation whatsoever to spirituality. They're new, they're, they're aware that some of them, they've accepted Christ, but most of them don't have this heritage to draw on. So he's sharing a little bit about the spirit world so they understand. So he mentions the Holy Spirit 17 times, but he also mentions an impure spirit six times. He mentions an evil spirit two times. He's, he's very careful to use two different words in these occasions. For us, we're like, oh, those are one and the same. Not according to Luke. He used two different words. He also referenced that there was a, a, a spirit or a sickness, disease, infirmity spirit. He refers to that four times. And then he refers to the human spirit five times. And I can give you a couple examples. Remember Mary? She said, my spirit rejoices. And even Jesus said the statement, into, into, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Okay, they're referring to their spirit nature, their spirit as a human being. And so what you notice, is, I'm going to ask if you think of, uh, think of this, look at the map. He refers to the Holy Spirit 17 times and he refers to these other spirits 17 times. Now I don't know if he did that consciously or not, but I just find it ironic it's 17 on the Holy Spirit and 17 on these other elements and types of spirits. So he's, he's really giving a mini seminar inside of his gospel, helping people to understand this. So let's look at this a little further. We're going to be looking at all the references of the Holy Spirit inside the book of Acts. Now some of these I can do really, really quick. And then we're going to get to the other elements as it relates to Jesus. But one, he, uh, the, John the Baptist and the Holy Spirit are used one time. The Holy Spirit and Elizabeth one time. Zechariah and the Holy Spirit one time. Mary and the Holy Spirit one time. Simeon and the Holy Spirit three times. And then Jesus and the Holy Spirit ten times. Where do you think I'm going to spend the rest, most of my message today? <laughs> See, how many know? You just look at that and go, we need to know what the Holy Spirit was doing with Jesus, right? I mean, it's just so obvious. You look at that and you go, we need to know. Wow, the Holy Spirit and Jesus' life. Need to know what that looked like. But let me touch you on, on a couple things because sometimes... As Pentecostals, we can act like the Holy Spirit was sitting on the shelf, and until Acts chapter 2 happened, there was no Holy Spirit. It was just sitting there on the shelf. And then Acts 2, God took it off the shelf, and here we are. Bless their souls, all those people who had to live all those centuries without the Holy Spirit. Can I just tell you that's false theology? I don't know who read it. I don't know who taught you that. But notice this, John the Baptist, it says, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. You notice the word filled. That'll mess with some Pentecostals. <laughs> what do you mean? The child will be filled in, in the womb. Okay. We go to Mary. She said the Holy Spirit, will, the angel said the Holy Spirit will come on you. So we read it's possible to be filled. We also read that the Holy Spirit can come on people. Elizabeth said, it says that she was filled with, you notice this is all in Luke chapter 1 too. It's like there's a mini Holy Spirit seminar in chapter 1. And then Zechariah, John the Baptist's dad, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Oh, how can he be functioning in the gifts of the Spirit? See, you, you all know what the rest of the sentence is, right? Like, that messes people up. But what I want you to see is, Three of the four instances in Luke chapter 1 says people were filled with the Holy Spirit. So some of you are thinking, well, are you getting ready to tell us that all of what came? Oh, no, no. I'm going to contextualize everything. Everybody with me? Please don't sweat in church because you're afraid I'm going to go off the rails here. <laughs> All's good. So then we come to Simeon, who's in the temple. 
And it says that the Holy Spirit was on him. Later on in chapter 2, it says it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. And then in chapter 2, it later says he was moved by the Holy Spirit and he went into the temple courts. So we read the Holy Spirit was very active in Simeon's life. So right now, I've just covered seven of the ten or seven of the 17 elements of teaching related to the Holy Spirit. And what I want you to see is this the Holy Spirit was active, it wasn't silent. And you say, I don't know if I agree with you. No, you know, you have to say, I don't know if I agree with Luke's presentation. Because all I did was read it. You say, well, I don't agree. Oh, okay, then I, what, I'm supposed to just erase those words out of the Bible because you don't like something? Okay, so now we're going to say, since we see this activity of the Holy Spirit, by the way, did you notice it was men and women? <laughs> Yeah, that was another big element of that day was how could, how could God be working through women? Wow, yeah, God was doing a new thing. So now let's begin to look at this. So let's look at Jesus' life. So everybody want to read number one with me. John the Baptist, he preached that there was a new dimension of the Holy Spirit coming through Jesus. Notice what he says. John, the Bapt John answered them all. I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. New word there, baptize. Because he's already been talking about the Holy Spirit coming on, the Holy Spirit filling. Now there's a new, and it says uh, that uh, uh, Simeon was led, right, by the Spirit. Now, all of a sudden, there's a new terminology in town called baptize. And he says, and fire. So what is he meaning by when John the Baptist said that? What was he saying? Number word, the word baptize means to immerse. Wow. So, by the way, there's two things here. So, so it says that John was saying, I will baptize you with water. I baptize you with water. He's saying, I'm immersing you with water. But he says that Jesus will immerse you in the Holy Spirit. Now, just kind of a side note. I know that there are some churches and things that practice that in a different way. But we're just saying this is how we practice. Why do we practice immersion? Because do you know how you said immerse in Greek? Baptizo. So here, here's the verbiage. See, we have to be careful of our verbiage because over a period of time it can lead us astray. People say, I was baptized by being sprinkled. That is an inconsistent statement because that's by saying I was immersed by being sprinkled. Yeah. And you know, how many know you just stand there and go, are you a politician? <laughs> what, what, what you just, I was immersed by sprinkled. I, I, and it's the same way some people say, well, I was poured, okay. So you, I, was bab, uh, I was baptized by being poured. So you were immersed by being poured. What political party do you belong to? <laughs> I mean, it's just, and I, and I'm, I mean, that really, I do. I, mean, I don't mean that in a, in a derogatory way. But it's, it's very important that we, listen, we stick with the scripture and not church traditions. Because over a period of time, it takes you places. It just, you just keep picking at the edges. And that's how over generations denominations have drifted because they, they, they stop citing the scripture as the authority. Okay? So this is key. G so John is saying, I'm immersing you in water. There's coming somebody who's going to immerse you in the Holy Spirit and fire. That was a radical thought. How, it was like, how's he going to do that? And the word fire, see, he also adds this phraseology. And the word fire there means symbolizing purifying and judgment. So he's saying the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit is coming a new dimension of conviction. I don't know about you, but that sounds really good. I think our cultures could use that today, right? So think about this. If we're resisting the Holy Spirit, then we're also resisting the conviction that he's been sent to do. Could it be that some of the things that we have today that people don't feel bad about when they should is because we've marginalized the one who has been sent to make them feel bad. Okay, I thought that was good. <laughs> yeah. 
See, sometimes we don't recognize some of the decisions and choices that we do and, and the fallout that's associated with it. We need a culture that is permeated by the Holy Spirit. Because that, listen, that stops crime. Okay? The problem is, is they're listening to the wrong voice in their head. And they need to be listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, just catch this, so he's saying, Jesus is going to bring a new dimension of the Holy Spirit. He just won't come on you. He just won't fill you. You are going to be immersed in it. Wow. Okay. So now let's begin to advance through the scripture to see how Luke addresses us even further. So number two, read this out loud. Jesus experienced a new dimension of the Holy Spirit when he was baptized. I know people go, wait, whoa, whoa, he's the son of God. He came with a complete package. Whoa. Let's read the scripture. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. Wow, even Jesus was immersed in water. And as he was praying, heaven was open and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. Wow. So Jesus is now starting a journey with the Holy Spirit, much like we in this room have to do. His obedience, his doing what the Father wanted him to do, produced a new dimension of the Holy Spirit that other people were able to see. By the way, we, we, read, we read the same thing. Jesus, you say, well, Jesus had the complete package. He didn't need to do it. Then why would, was Jesus taken to the temple and dedicated by his parents? Why? Because Jesus had to grow in his faith just like we have to grow in our faith. There was this element of the Holy Spirit out there. And what I'm just going to tell, I'm just, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag now. You ready? <laughs> Luke is showing us how Jesus grew in the Holy Spirit. Oh, we just think he came out of the womb and he had it all. No, Jesus had to grow in his faith. Jesus had to grow in his walk, just like you and I do. And so what he's doing is he's laying out how Jesus grew in his walk with the Holy Spirit. So getting baptized was a demonstration, there was a demonstration, the Holy Spirit is now becoming a part of Jesus' active life. Now, we go to Luke, Luke chapter 4, verse 1. How many know we just jumped a few verses? We're in chapter 3, we're in chapter 4. And it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Two elements. First time it says that Jesus is now full of the Spirit. And it says now that he is sensitive enough about the spirit that he knows that he is being led to go into the wilderness and he's going to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. Hey, anybody that goes into the desert and fasts for 40 days and 40 nights, you better, you better make sure it's the Holy Spirit taking you out there. Okay. So now we read, whereas it descended upon him. Now he's filled, and now he's being led, and then as he comes out of the wilderness, it says that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. New phrase, power of the Spirit. And what we recognize is this. Now Jesus has what he needs to do ministry. You see that? Because I'm going to read a scripture here right after this that will show you because in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, he's now in the synagogue. And he says this, the spirit of the Lord is on me. This is really incredible. It has now reached a point that Jesus knows the Holy Spirit is on him. See, he was full, he, it descended like a dove. He was then full of the spirit, which led him to the wilderness. He's come back, he's in the power of the spirit. And now he understands what that Holy Spirit is for. How many know if it's called the power of the Spirit, you're expected to change something? The Spirit of the Lord is on me. Why? To do it. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus came back in the power of the Spirit, stood in the synagogue, and he said, let me tell you why I have what I have. The Spirit that's on my life is for this. Pretty radical. Jesus had grown into the momentum of the Holy Spirit for his life. It just didn't like happen. He grew into it. Everybody see that? So now we're going to go, so how does... 
How does Jesus teach his disciples and teach other people about the Holy Spirit? I'm glad you asked that because I just happened to be ready for that. <laughs> so, Jesus then began to teach about the Holy Spirit. So, in Luke chapter 11, verse 11 through 13, this is a passage that is often used for a variety of teachings, okay? And, it, and let me read it. Which of you fathers, if you're, this is Jesus talking, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though, are, if, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Do you see the summary statement? That whole teaching is related to asking about the Holy Spirit. This is not just asking for healing. This is related to the Holy Spirit. How about if I show you a bunch of teaching associated with this? How many know it is verse 11? How many know that means there's 10 verses before? What if I told you that this is related to the Lord's Prayer? Well, well, prove it. I hear you. All right? So let's back it up. A lot of teaching, we have a tendency to segment Scripture rather than staying with the momentum of Scripture. So let's go all the way back to verse 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples to pray. And here's a familiar passage that we all know. Okay? He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. And we wrap it up and everybody says, Amen. What if I said that's only about a third of the teaching? Because when you go to verse 5, then Jesus said to them, Oh, how many know it sounds like he's still talking? See, we like to stop because it's the next part that gets really uncomfortable. So we sort of segment it away and not understand Jesus is still telling this to the disciples about how to pray. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you, you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose this one inside answers, don't bother me, the door is already locked and my children and I are in bed, I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, how's that? He will surely get up and give you as much as you need. He then begins to go to a wrap up on this. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Notice he's saying, have some persistence, right? For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. And then he says this, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though, are evil, how much how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? All that, and Jesus is saying, stay persistent, keep, you want to pray like me, be persistent, keep asking. For what? What does the last sentence say? Ask, what are we being persistent about asking for? Okay, only a third of you, two thirds of you didn't want to answer because then it'll feel, make you feel obligated. That whole team, Jesus said, they said, teach us to pray. And Jesus says, well, then you're going to have to be real persistent about asking for the Holy Spirit. Knock, keep on knocking. Ask, keep on asking. Stay at it. This is interesting because what Jesus is telling us is this. For whatever reason, some people have to stay persistent in receiving the Holy Spirit. It sounds like he's implying that some people get it easier than others. But he's saying, just because you're having a difficult time receiving it doesn't give you an exit ramp. 
then keep on knocking and keep persisting and keep pressing. Do not back off. You keep asking. And then there's this other thing that comes into our mind. What, what, if, what if it's not the real deal? And he answers that. Which of you fathers, if you had a son, ask for a fish, would give him a snake instead? And what Jesus says is this. You just keep right on asking and you keep on knocking and don't you back off. And by the way, Jesus says, I will not send you a fake. If you're sincere and you're all in and you want to receive the Holy Spirit, he says, you want to, you want to pray like me? Then you're going to have to keep asking for the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, amen. amen. Yeah. Oh, by the way, Jesus is not done teaching on the Holy Spirit. In verse 12, in chapter 12, so we've gone from chapter 11, now we're in verse 12. There's this verse that everybody, oh my gosh, have I ever done this? And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemies against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. We just look at, we just stare at that verse. Oh, dear God, please. <laughs> that I've never done that. Please tell me I've never done that, Jesus. And I, first thing I always tell people is this. If you have any sense of conviction that you're worried about that, that says right there, the Holy Spirit hasn't left you. Because people who do that feel, don't feel bad one bit. See, the Holy Spirit's been sent to convict. So if the Holy Spirit has left, then there's no conviction in the room. In the secular world, they call it a seared conscience. But how many know? We need to go back and see what the momentum of the previous verses are so we can understand what's being said here. Please tell me, yes. yes. All right, here we go. So let's put this in context. Let's go back to verse eight. I tell you, this is Jesus talking. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the son of man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me, before others will be disowned before the angels of God. Why is he saying this? Because Christians are being hauled into the courts and in front of government officials and they are being threatened with death. Deny your God or die. Now, we could rehearse this in the room. I would never do You know, none of us knows what we'll do until we're actually put in that boat and especially if they threaten our families. That if you don't deny, I'm going to kill your family. You say, I, I would hopefully would never do that. That's what we would say. But nobody knows until you're there. And how many know we can read the Bible and find people who did fail? Twelve disciples. They were put under the gun and they caved. So this is why the next verse is critical. Because it says this. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will acknowledge before the angels of men. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. Look at this. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. How many know there is a hopeful line right there? Yeah. See, that was, that was the apostles. That was the disciples way back. That was Peter's way back. So what's, what's so awesome is this. If for whatever reason we find ourselves in a situation and you say or do something denying your faith and you walk away and go, God, I'm so shamed in myself for what I just did. Can I tell you that's a sign that the Holy Spirit's working in you? Because he was sent to not only immerse you, but also to touch you with fire. That's, that's the Holy Spirit convicting you. That's, there are some things we should feel bad about. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully you feel bad about it sometimes. Okay. There's some things that ought to bother us. Okay. Now catch, but anyone who blasphemies against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. So this is moving on from Jesus in front of government officials who are calling you into account. You're on trial for your faith. And he says, there's a difference between denying me as the son of God and you cursing the Holy Spirit in that context and telling the Holy Spirit to get out of the room and leave you alone. Jesus says the Holy Spirit will leave. And guess what? That means there's no conviction in the room. 
how do you repent if you don't feel convicted? Does everybody understand the difference? See, I can, I can fail Jesus, but there's still the Holy Spirit convicting me. But if I curse under pressure of being... See, this context is not just a whim. These folks are on trial. They're being hauled in in front of... And he's saying, leave the Holy Spirit alone. You need that in the room. All of us do. It's our only hope of finding our way back to Jesus when we stumble. Without the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we're all doomed. Because then we don't even feel bad. And now, to show you how this works, I'm going to take you to the last point. Because in verses 11 and 12, he, he continues on. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about what you will or about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say. Finish reading it with me. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at the time what you should say. Does everybody see that uh, he's saying? Keep the Holy Spirit in the room. You may not have time to write your speech. You may not have time. But the Holy Spirit will be whispering in your ear. But if you curse the Holy Spirit and tell him to get out of the room and leave you alone, he will. So don't ever ask him to do that. That's why when people come to me and they say, well, I don't know if I've done it or not. I said, do you feel bad? Are you worried about it? Yeah, I said, then that means the Holy Spirit is still working on you. Because <laughs> if you did that, it wouldn't even bother you. One iota. Why? Because the one who convicts of right and wrong has left you. Now, this is probably not the time to say, well, now let's all go home and just have a great day. <laughs> so I'm going to give you one other element. And then we'll wrap this up. As I've told you, Luke wrote a second book called the Book of Acts. And it's important to know that in the Book of Acts, he picks up where he left off with the Book of Luke. And so he moves from 17 times on the Holy Spirit to over 50 times in the book of Acts. But chapter 1 has some really critical information related to everything that I just said. We saw the teachings of Jesus on the Holy Spirit, right? And he says, keep on asking, keep on knocking, don't stop. You want to pray like me? Then just get absolutely pursuant about the Holy Spirit, which explains what he says in Acts chapter 1. Let me take you there. Jesus told his followers to seek the new dimension of the Holy Spirit that was now available to him. In Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, on one occasion while he was eating with them, this is Jesus and the disciples, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Emerge. So this is interesting. John prophesied this, right? And everything that we read in Luke says the immersion has not happened. The Spirit is working, but there is a greater dimension yet to come, the immersion of the Holy Spirit. Everybody follow me? And he's telling his disciples, don't be satisfied with what you see currently of the Holy Spirit. There's more. So this is not you either have it or you don't. No, listen, we're all on a journey. We're all growing. The key is, is do I want to step now into this dimension? And that, let me tell you, that's our walk with Jesus. It's dimension by dimension. I'm assuming the day you got saved, you didn't know everything you needed to know. <laughs> and so what? You committed to a journey, right? New dimensions of learning about who Jesus was and growing in your faith. And it's the same way with this Holy Spirit. So what, was the, what were the disciples' response to this? This is interesting. Look. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He says, you have always wanted to pray like me. Well, then you're going to have to be immersed in the Holy Spirit like me. And they go. So like this is the end times, right? I mean, this is it, baby. This is where, this is, like, totally so what happens is this, they try to get into the prophecy of end times, and Jesus is, is trying to get them into the reality of today and the Holy Spirit, 
and they want to trade the reality of the Holy Spirit today. They want to trade it, and they want to get into the prophecy. And, what, and, and he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. He basically says, can you shut down your prophecy curiosity? I mean, I don't know how else you explain that. You will receive power. Remember Jesus came back from the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit? He's telling them. I'm going to show you how to do this. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Well, man, they were going to need something. If they were going to go to the ends of the earth, those, those were people they hated. They called them, they called them barbarians. They called them heathen. They called them Gentiles. They called them pagans. They were gonna, and that word power is interesting. He says, you will receive, and, he, and, and then he goes on to say, you will be my witnesses. The word witness, if you go into the Greek, is the same word that is translated sometimes as martyrs. What is a martyr? A martyr is a person who will do whatever it takes to get the job done, up including them forfeiting their life. A martyr is, says, I will t get this job done if it even costs me my life. It may not, but I will not back off just because the stakes get high. I will do this. And that's why he says we need the power. And the word power comes from the Greek word dunamis, which is where we get the word dynamite. So let me just say, it. we're designed to make an explosive impact in the world. And our attitude is, and I'm going to do whatever it takes. Now here's the thing, we have a thing called the flesh that says, are you crazy? <laughs> That's why you need the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, I'm all in. I want to pray like you. I want to be like you. I want to do the things that you do. And I understand the first time I asked for it, it may not happen. But you told me, be persistent. Keep on knocking. Keep on asking. Don't back off. The best thing, I'm going to wrap this up. The best thing that I could do for you today is this, as we wrap this up. We're going to stand in just a minute, and I'm going to give everybody in this room the opportunity, listen, for you to ask for all of the Holy Spirit that God intends for your life. Do you hear me? You ask him. Don't, don't, don't say, well, my pastor, no. You ask for all the Holy Spirit that Jesus wants to give you. The best thing that I can do for you today is this. You walk out of here and you go, I don't know if I received it or not. Okay. Then let's fall back to Jesus' teaching. The best thing I can do for you today is when you get in your car, you keep on asking. When you go home this afternoon and maybe you get on the back deck or you sit somewhere by yourself and you could have a thousand things to think about and you say, I could do a thousand things right now, but God, I'm going to ask you again. I want this. And I want it bad. I want to pray like you. When you're in the car tomorrow, maybe you're headed to work, you actually turn the radio off and say, here I am again. I want this. I'm going to keep on asking. I'm going to keep on pursuing. Because I saw what the pastor said yesterday. He did nothing. How many know I did nothing but quote the scripture? I didn't talk about a book. I didn't talk about an author. I just showed you what the, you're going to say, if that, that makes sense to me, then I want that. And so, God, you're going to be stuck hearing from me about this a lot. I'm the guy who says in the middle of the night, I've got three loaves, I need three loaves, I've got guests, get up and give it to me. You don't have to be my friend tonight, you just need to be my provider. That's the best thing I could do is create a hunger in you that you just will not back off. That every you want it so bad. And you know what? Some of you will receive it easily. That's great. Others, just know the Bible makes accommodation and then say, the, the, 
Bible makes a commendation, and it says, then be persistent about it. You stay on that path, you stay on that journey, and you keep asking God. And everybody said amen. amen. Come on, let's stand to our feet now. Come on, we're going to wrap up the service. I want, listen, right now, I want you just to lift your hands. And first of all, can you do 60 seconds of saying, God, I want to thank you for the Holy Spirit. I understand why you said it. I understand what it's for. Before I get in the asking mode and pleading, I'm just going to say thank you for that. Because maybe I didn't quite understand what this was all about. So come on, 60 seconds, praise Him right now.